As well, I would like to actually just acknowledge that we are on Treaty 8 territorial lands, so and we thank them for allowing us to be here. Um, I'd like to quickly introduce Robert, who is going to introduce Ramona. Thank you very much. So uh, just a little uh, quick background uh, before Ramona's presentation. So the, um, the college is doing a refresh from a labor market study that was done in 2012. And we're, we're solely focusing on northeastern uh, British Columbia. So we've been up to Fort Nelson. We're here today. We're heading to Tumbler Ridge, uh, Dawson Creek, and for, back to Fort St. John. Well, we're, we're interviewing uh, a mix of industry, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, school, school district, high school, student focus groups, um, and um, just to kind of gather a sense as to where we are now and where we're going. And, and the, the interest the college has is to make sure or do the best we can to uh, look at the programs that we're offering now, the programs that we should offer in the future, and how we should have that balance of, of, of what we have going on. So um, um, without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ramona for her, her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much. And I, I will promise that the talk will be 20 to 25 minutes so that there is time for questions from you. And then, of course, you, I know you've got to get back to running your businesses, so we'll uh, keep it there. And I'd like to thank the Naomi and the Chamber and everyone for having us here today. Uh, it's great. Just um, what we're going to do is to three things with just a little bit more detail on what Robert was speaking about in terms of what we're researching and then you say well what's AI and robots well part of the work we're doing is looking into subjects more deeply for the college and, and when we get to that section I'll explain why the college would be very interested in this in this topic and then from the AI and robots what are the implications for the Northeast because actually for robotics could have a very big impact on the Northeast even when you look across Canada rural regions can be particularly affected uh, by changes in technology so as uh, Robert said this is uh, you know we're here we're we've been to Fort Nelson this is the region we're, we're covering it's a economic development region of, of the province and uh, we're doing some labor market projections work. Actually, I just sent the report to Robert last night. And you're saying, why are we doing labor market projections with two, two seniors? The reason is, is because actually, if you look at the next 10 years in this region, the bulk of the new jobs that will come will come because of retirements. Only about a quarter of the new jobs will be because of expansion. The, and you could say, oh, but what about LNG? But that's the short term. But the longer term jobs in the next 10 years. So if you think of any particular job or if you have children or grandchildren and they're wondering what to do, one of the things we're saying to the schools, unless you want to be like a film star or in animation and you have to move to another part of the province or another country, most jobs that your children or grandchildren might be interested in would be available for them coming up in, in the Northeast. So it's not just trades, just the whole gamut of uh, occupations will be available. So to keep that in mind of the large numbers of people retiring, and um, for those of you not at retirement age, the opportunities that will be opening up and the opportunities for your business. So we're doing interviews, and uh, we've I think to this point we've probably done about Mm, 50 to 60 interviews. Most of them we do in person. We're also doing some work on the phone. And, and the point is, is you discover quite a lot of more interesting things when you do interviews than you do necessarily than when you do a survey and ask people to fill out an online survey. It's a more expensive way of gathering data, but it's a much richer way of gathering information from the people that you're, you're trying to um, speak to. We've done focus groups. Um, we did, th to this morning, we did, um, I guess, our seventh. And this one, Ochalo School in, in uh, its First Nation school in, near Fort Nelson. And one of the reasons, and we're a little bit different as a company, most times when people do labor market studies, they have a tendency to look at college and onwards. And one of the innovations we brought to this was is to actually look at high schools. Because a key point for the region is, is are your high school students 
aware of the opportunities for them in this region or are they planning to leave the region? So one of the questions we ask them, and it's just a little survey that they fill out, we ask them quite directly, do you think you can have a good career in Northeast BC? And we don't have the, we haven't tallied it up yet, but it'll be interesting to report back to the schools if the students, these are grade 11 and 12 students, if they've got the message of the, the huge variety of opportunities for them in the Northeast, or if they're getting a message, if you want to go into trades, you have a marvelous career in the Northeast, but if you want to be anything else, you better move somewhere else, which is not the message the Northeast really wants to give to its young people. The message that we're promoting based on the data is, most things that you want to do, unless they're highly specialized, you can, you can do right here uh, in the region. So this is where uh, the other thing we're doing is a deeper, we're calling it deeper research on specialized topics because much of our work for NLC is very much gathering data, looking at existing data, but this is where we found it valuable because we've done this work in other parts of the province, is to actually take topics that the college is interested in and or topics that we think they might want to be interested in and go a little bit deeper. So the rest of this, this presentation to you really is to look at some of the research we've done on a deeper topic which is artificial intelligence and robotics. But specifically, what does that mean or what could it mean for the Northeast? So it's specialized and then a little bit more specialized um, geographically. And this is, a, or have any of you looked into this topic or you're from the IT sector? Anyone familiar? Okay, well this will, you probably find it uh, interesting. This here is a series uh, that was done by the National Post, The Rise of the Robot. Because one of the things with robotics is the big debate is, robot, no, one, no one debates that robotics will lead to job loss. Where the debate is, is will robotics create so many new jobs that they offset the jobs that are, are lost? And that is, um, I've heard strong arguments on both sides. That is not a settled point. And you can see if you read the underline here, robots aren't, kill robots aren't killing jobs, they're creating new ones and more of them. And that's one argument. But there's also an argument that says there, there's going to be those new jobs require a whole set of different skills than the ones that they replaced. And whether or not people can just smoothly move into those new jobs is a, is a question. So that was a, an interesting series. And this is the Europeans and the, Jap the Japanese, probably robotics. Are any of you have Japanese relatives or been to Japan recently? Well, the Japanese, it, it's, and I would say the Europeans, but particularly with the Japanese, is they have a, a very aging population. The Japanese attitude culturally towards robots is different from here. And it's, a, it's a, based on their religious background and the, the culture, is you will see a lot of use of robotics in seniors' homes, robots in seniors' homes. And there's not the sort of ooh factor that you might get here. And if you go to Tokyo Airport, there's, there are robotic greeters there. And it's, it's a much, the, because of the culture, it's much more, uh, it's easier to move forward, I think, with robotics uh, interacting with humans and not just in big industrial car plants or that kind of a thing. Now this, this chart is, uh, I find, really interesting because what we're looking at is these are companies and their market capitalization uh, through the stock market at a, at a moment in time. So if you look at 2006, what you see here, you see a lot of companies you might have expected. You see a lot of oil companies. So you've got Exxon, uh, GE, General Electric. You've got uh, British BP's British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, Microsoft, most people have heard of, Citigroup, large American bank. So that's 2006. Those are the world's most valuable publicly traded companies. Now, I updated this because this was before from 2016. If you look at 2018, what companies, and that's you know, a year ago now, what companies were seen as most valuable or what the market valued? Most, anyone have an iPhone? Anyone here have an iPhone? Yeah. 
you swear, thank you, I'm a stockholder in Apple as well. So Apple, okay, they are at, at that time, the 2018 markets go up and down. They were the world's most valuable company. What are they? They're a tech company, they have hardware as well, phones, iPads, that kind of thing. Amazon, no surprise. Um, Alphabet, what's Alphabet? Alphabet is Google. Alphabet is the holding company for Google. Uh, Microsoft, still there, pretty valuable. Facebook, obvious. Alibaba, perhaps, is not so obvious. Alibaba um, is, and we were told by someone who, use, who uses it, is like a Chinese Amazon. So they've, uh, Alibaba has come out of nowhere. I would bet if we looked at 2019 numbers at the end of 2019, you may see another Chinese company there as well in, in the tech world. But the point to take from this is, is just this whole rise of tech. Whereas in 2006, you had familiar companies, oil companies, a big industrial company. Now you're moving to um, much more, I mean, the whole, whole all of these are, are high tech or some kind of online, um, Amazon obviously buying online. Well, I should remember, if you have questions or comments throughout, please feel free to make them. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So them companies, the Exxon and stuff, how low are they below these? Are they like at the bottom of the list now or are they just below these ones? I, you know, it's a good question. I don't know. I know that GE would be way down because GE probably at the time in 2006, even and then it might have been 30 or 40 dollars a share and they went down this year as low as eight dollars a share so i'd say ge and ge it could potentially be broken up they've had a lot of problems um bp uh, exxon i think is still very valuable um citigroup most american banks really got hammered that was 2006 and then you think of 2008 2009 citigroup is back american banks are coming up so they're still very large but i'm not sure they're at eight nine and ten I, I, I wouldn't say for sure, but it's a good question and I should look into it. I was just looking at these top one, two, three, four, five, six, but it's, it, it's a point. But the other thing too though is these businesses are shifting. Robert and I were just talking about this yesterday with Shell, for example. Shell, big oil company, but is making pretty big investments in clean energy wind farm, solar, uh, particularly in Europe, and they may be, I don't know if they're starting to do that here as well. Um, similarly, BP is, is moving into that renewables uh, energy space, so they're changing their businesses. This is, uh, as business people, I, I think you'd find this interesting. What PwC does every year, uh, it does this annual report, of long-term threats and risks to business, and these are global CEOs of large companies. They do about 1,750 to 1,800 companies around the world, mainly big, big companies. But they do two sets of risks. One set is what they see as long-term risks, like they're not right in your face today, but they're coming. And then they do this one, which we're looking at, are top of mind, and they're more related to the ease of doing business. And what's interesting in this is if you look at the, from the college's perspective, is in 2018, a year ago, oh, they always do it in January, so January 2018, availability of key skills was the number five risk related to doing business. If you look by 2019, it's moved up to number three. And the messaging there from, from global CEOs is finding people with the skills they need. And you see that replicated in, on a smaller scale in Canada. The, what's, what's referred in the jargon as skills mismatch. So you say there's these people who are unemployed and then these, the companies are saying, we can't fill the positions. We just, uh, we interviewed someone recently just on this tour who said, I, I can't find certified people of such and such. I can find people who've done it lots, but they don't have a ticket. And I need, I need them to have a ticket. I need the, the certification. So sometimes it may be a certification thing, but sometimes it may be that you simply can't find the skills. And uh, an example I'll give is a short haul railway company that we interviewed for, for another client. They are changing, they're putting sensors on all their rail cars, so they'll be able to tell within 15 meters of where their rail cars are, which in their business is a really big thing. 
but they can't, they, they're in Alberta, they can't find enough people who are trained in that area. They're having to train them themselves, but it's going to make huge difference to their company in terms of efficiency. But they, and this is where you've got this availability of key skills. They're a really good example. It's a really key skill for them. They can't find it. And the institutes in Alberta aren't, they have some courses, but they're not churning out people fast enough because a lot of people will compete for those same graduates. Excuse me. Yep. Yeah. Um, the climate change factor is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. It was rated nine last year and it's dropped in uh, 13. Yeah. yeah. Explain. It's interesting. We did, uh, for another client, we did a chart. The people who get really, is anyone here in the insurance business? Are you insurance a little bit? Yeah, okay. Uh, anyone in, well, there's people in banking. Yeah, the people who really get exercised about climate change is uh, a, a lot of times our insurance and, and increasingly banking, because insurance is a really interesting chart to see how whatever your thoughts on climate change, but to see how the number of hurricanes, natural disasters and all that is just, it's sort of like this and now it's going like this. But from year to year, like a particular year, you may have a whole bunch of hurricanes, which brings it sort of more top of mind. And I don't know what 2019, if it was as bad, but you see in the charts, the insurance people is because these like in, I don't know, some of you may have seen on the news earlier this spring that in um, uh, Quebec and Ontario, Ottawa, and then the eastern townships of Quebec, the the hundred year flood occurred again. It happened three years ago, and now it occurred again. And it's it's I think probably very top of mind for business because of this this uh, um, this flooding. But because these are short term, when you look at longer term threats, climate change and natural disasters are actually quite high. But this is kind of a bit of a right now snapshot. So um, just getting on to, this is the automation. This was a series, it was done in 2017 by the Globe and Mail. And I found it, it's based on uh, a report uh, done by the Brookfield Institute, which does some interesting research here. And what they were looking at is trying to make some predictions as to what, getting back to that debate I talked about, well, what impact will automation have on jobs? They decided to look at particular communities across Canada, looking at what their industries typically are, what, what they are, and then saying how at risk are they from automation. And I, I put risk because this is these are predictions. And I think that's very much to keep in mind. This is not saying this will happen, but it's like here are some tendencies. So this, and I looked before I gave this presentation, I looked to see if the Brookfield has actually updated their data because they built basis on 2011 census data. And 2016 has been out for a couple years, but they haven't updated it. So this is a little bit old, but I still thought it was interesting. Why I thought it was interesting is because they did break it down, and CMA stands for Census Metropolitan Area, which is a Statistics Canada geeky thing, but what it, in the case of Fort St. John here, it's Fort St. John and the region around it. So not just the city, but you know, Carol, you would know this, you have the city, but then there's stuff around it. So they, the CMA takes that in. So Fort St. John is on this list of communities that could, not saying will, but could have be heavily impacted by automation. And where that automation is, where the, the, the steps are being made, and, and depending on what your businesses are, are in, because it's got a heavy concentration of mining, quarrying, oil and gas extraction. And those, some of the lower skilled jobs in those industries are ripe for automation not everything not every part but when we gave this presentation in the northwest people had seen it in real life in terms of uh, a mill a sawmill in houston they had updated their equipment people lost their jobs and it wasn't because the mill wasn't efficient it was because there was new machinery that was brought in so that is something again uh, for the college we were saying okay you you need to keep an eye on this because the, what are the implications for 
uh, retraining people. And this is a, another, this is from the National Post again, difficult for people to read, but a lot of what they're saying in here is what would be the probability of automation, your job being automated in 10 to 20 years. And you may think, well, I'm not going to be in the labor force, but your children or grandchildren may be in the labor force. And in terms of what kind of careers they get into. So a lot of it is, is um, and this, um, these books here uh, talk about that. If this is a subject of interest to you, these, I've read all these books, and actually the Second Machine Age has a, a, a second edition. Uh, this is the first edition. And why I put these three here as an example, why I like them is because they take diametrically opposed views. So if you look at um, this one, humans need not apply, he's a bit mid middle of the road. The Rise of the Robots, Martin Ford, and you can watch him on YouTube as well. He's got quite a few talks on YouTube. He's very much, we all need a basic income, we're all going to, you know, not we're all, but a lot of jobs. He's a pessimist that we're actually going to survive, um, not survive, but a lot of jobs are going to be eliminated. Second Machine Age, they're very techy, but they do have some interesting points. They're very good to read for their sense of what's, what's happening in, in AI uh, and robotics. And there's all kinds of TED Talks, and there's a lot, if this is topic is of interest to you, there's, there's a lot out there. But those were three books that I thought were relatively readable. Uh, and, and interesting. Martin Ford gives a very good talk as well. He's the middle guy, Rise of the Robots. And what um, this, the, one of the books, Humans Need Not Apply, what they're saying is, he's middle of the road, but he's saying, okay, what's causing this? What's this tipping point? Why are we tipping? Why are we talking more about AI and automation? And this is the cocktail he talks about, the increases in computing power um, machine learning, which is t putting through large data sets so a machine learns patterns. Uh, design improvements in industrial robots. I was just reading uh, on the weekend, there's this little, they're getting these, they, I always tended to think of industrial robots as like big honking things, but there's one that's kind of like this, the, the little industrial ones, they're really tiny, so they can do tiny tasks. And so there's, there's big industrial robots like you see in the car factories, but they're also looking at smaller ones as well. The vision in industrial robots are getting better. The ability to walk onto, you know, R, it's not R2-D2, what's the other one in Star Wars? C3PO. Is it the, the walker guy? Yeah, C-3PO. They're getting robots who can, two-legged and, and walk kind of thing. So there's, there's movement, pardon the pun, <laughs> that's happening. And the acceleration in machine perception which is, again, very important um, in the robotic space. So all this is, is coming together, and the sheer power of the computers and the changes that are coming in the uh, industry. So the final bit, we've talked sort of generally, we're looking at some of the specifics here in what could it mean for the Northeast, which is, and we're taking it from the perspective of education and training, because that's what the college is, is interested in. We did, uh, I sent it to Robert last week, we did a paper on the impact of mining, uh, of technology in mining, because of course, you know, in Tumblr Ridge, there's the coal mines, and there's some other possibilities. So HD and tech have kind of, I don't know what the term is, but shuttered mines right now. But what would be that effect? And basically, it's um, a lot of jobs will require higher, higher skills. Uh, Ralph Bullis, who's the geologist who, who did this work for us, is saying some of these jobs won't be eliminated, but the skill set people will need will change. And just as an example is, um, does anyone have people who work at Suncor or Syncrude? Anyone? No? Well, this, for example, it's not will eliminate. This is an older article, but have eliminated. And what's going on in the mine at uh, Suncor, I've not been at Suncor's mine, I've been at, at Syncrude's mine, is these driverless trucks. And they have sensors all over the place. But the bottom line is, is jobs that paid between $100,000 and $200,000 a year with overtime, they're not there anymore. 
And I was just at a mining conference in Vancouver two weeks, not a conference, a talk two weeks ago, and at my table was another company, and they were saying in one of their BC company, and they're saying, yeah, in another of our properties, we're putting in six, um, six trucks and we're automating them. We're working with the consultants to automate them. And they were aware that those drivers weren't going to get weren't going to have jobs and they said well there'll probably be more maintenance jobs because we'll maintain them more we'll we'll do more with them and and that's that point of new jobs but as any of you who are or know of people who are say heavy duty mechanics you don't take a 6 week training course and become one like it's that that and so that's the issue with jobs being eliminated is there's new jobs but do those new jobs require training and how long will that training be and does the person even want to be a heavy duty equipment mechanic so that's that's kind of a, a conundrum i think retail employment this is is um anyone been to mcdonald's lately dawson you know you probably know a lot of the i don't know i haven't been to dawson mcdonald but i've been in some other ones and you know you punch in uh, your your order and so forth and uh, with retail again it's the sometimes it's it's the self checkouts but some of the backroom stuff it's a little hard to read but you can see some there of of some of the um, uh, positions that could be affected and. Sobeys, this is an older picture, but Sobeys just announced about a month ago, this is one warehouse I think they have in Ontario, they're opening another even more automated warehouse in um, Quebec, outside of Montreal. Uh, Amazon's warehouses are moving more and more to, uh, to automation. So when you're looking at the warehousing industry, what is going to happen there and, and the needs that they'll have for trained people to run those warehouses. This is, I, I, I took this one, we show this to high school students uh, when we talk to them because people say, well, I could always go in and work in a quick service fast food restaurant. But this is Flippy the Burger Flipper. And you, if you go to San Francisco, I haven't been to see it, but I understand you could, people, you know, stand outside and watch Flippy doing it. And, and this is actually a video. You can go to this site and video and you can see Flippy doing its thing where it, puts on and puts the cheese and so forth and then ends it up on the on the tray. Now, I don't think the whole restaurant will be automated, but you as a as a person in the back, you may be working with a with a robot. So that's part of the thing too is that yourselves or your children or grandchildren may be in more situations where your your part of the work is done electronically or robotically and and you're you're working with uh, working with that. Kind of says it all. Um, this is this is from May. What was it? May the third this year, in terms of the digital uh, economy, in terms of the growth of jobs in that uh, economy. This, if you're wondering what this guy is doing, these are some of the I believe some of the servers for the cryptocurrency mania. <laughs> so you have to you have a lot of computing power for for that stuff. Something to keep in mind is if you look at this list, uh, maybe I'll move, so I, but if you look at the list, you can see that there are these jobs. Uh, someone said to me, well, Canis Marketer existed a long time. It's just that it's legal now. So it's, maybe it's not as old as it was, but, uh, you know, so, but we're talking straight up, uh, you can have a card, you know, because I'm sure with the, with the big Canvas companies, you, you meet marketers. I mean, that's their job, sell the product. So, but if you look at these and, and um, they weren't as, maybe they existed, but they weren't as prevalent as they are here. Uh, the car, the driverless car engineers, uh, there's a lot, um, uh, a lot of these jobs we, we couldn't have, have, have thought of, but are, are now there. And again, that, how does this tie back? Because the college has to start thinking, does the college offer a drone operator school? There's going to be a big shortage of drone operators in the next two years. Right now, if you want to get drone training, you can get them from small private schools. We're aware that Fenshaw College in Ontario offers a year-long 
all meal deal drone training program but a lot of industries are starting to retail others are starting to look at drone operators so the thing is is for the college is to be looking ahead to be thinking okay where what's going on and also what can happen if people are lose their jobs and need to be retrained what level are they at because if you don't use skills for many years, you lose them. So if you haven't been using your basic math or reading or writing skills for many years and you're laid off, oftentimes there's a big uh, upgrading component that, uh, that has to go into it. So this is why you're thinking, why are we looking at this? Is to, to help the college start thinking about maybe what they need to think about. Uh, just a, another couple of slides. This is from a uh, 20, I think it's a 2018 report, and it doesn't include Canada. It was Germany, uh, the United States, and I think it was one of the United Kingdom. But what they were saying is the predictions are here is the, the, the changing of in-demand skills. How do you do things? Very complicated chart, but if you look on this side, on the change in hours, this, this here, is what you're seeing is, is the skill sets that people will need in many jobs will go to applying expertise. Why? Because robots can't do it. So applying expertise, interacting with stakeholders, and it doesn't have to be so jargony as that. Here, people want a, a human nurse or a human doctor, that kind of interaction. And there's a whole bunch of areas where people want to interact with people. So those skill sets will increase. Managing and developing people. So that whole leadership, uh, when we were talking to the rail person, the one you know with the sensors on the, on the cars, she said our expectations of our 26 and 27 and 28 year olds who are putting this system in place for us are much higher than when I was 26, 27, 28. And the reason being is they have to interact with the whole organization to get these, these systems to work and the retraining that's needed, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, where it's going to decrease in time, and these again, are this is to 2030, so it's 11 years from now, who knows, that's a long time. But where the expectation is are skills of processing data, collecting data, and this is the biggest one here, predictable physical activities. The kind of uh, strong, bra strong back kind of jobs, that's, those are the ones high risk for, uh, for uh, automation and you can see in the terms of the predictions is the number of hours the number the number of um, hours people spend in that decrease quite a decrease quite a lot so I leave you with this question because I I have no better crystal ball than you do but the question for the college and then the question for people in their businesses and in their careers is what could be the impact and to, uh, to think about that. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Um, a comments and questions. I'm in one of those fields that you had on the list. Oh, okay. Sustainability planning. It, it comes from a background in planning, per se, and then right. you get into and use our science, and then you can kind of start to look at sustainability. Right? It's really interesting to look at the data that you talk about. There's a strong bias, obviously, in urban base of information. Right. And when you put up the drone thing, I, it's, it tweaked me because there's a firm here that does a lot of specialization in drone. It's a huge growth thing. Uh, if you look at fire hazard mapping, for example, it's a fraction of the cost of human-based uh, mapping for fire risk hazard. Uh, water sampling technology, all these hundreds of companies using sampling, well, that can all be done with nanotechnology sensors now for a fraction of the cost. So what, I, what drives me when I, when I hear this is it's not just reacting to the technology change by getting in front of it and positioning ourselves in the north. Um, we're a resource industry, we do, there's nothing here really on the tourism sector, but it's like $90 million a year in the South Peaks alone. It's huge, it's growing, and then so is the amenity region. 
that people are actually, young people are buying land, like in Moberly, for example. There are young people, they're, they're actually saying, I can't live in this house. I can live here. We've got broadband technology. And we can actually position ourselves as this northern footloose type of business enterprise and northern amenity and really look at the diversification and position. So it's interesting to see where the data is going to go with this to actually look at what does it mean for rural communities? Are we going to have Uber, more Uber businesses for delivering? Or are we going to have driverless for the rural, servicing the, a lot of the rural populations of the big regions? And any thoughts on kind of where things are going in the, the really remote and rural? Well, I think, as I say, I mean, I think there, you look at companies uh, to stick with your sustainability. You, you'll go to big environmental trade fairs and you will have companies, Big Shell, Suncor, they will be there because they're looking at innovative new technologies to do exactly what you said. I saw, I met, I saw a presentation, a young woman out of MIT with a bio, biology degree and in, 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 in biological engineering or something. It was an engineering plus biology. She was maybe in her early 20s and she had developed a filter that does a really, I don't know the technology of it, but does a really good job figuring out if the water is contaminated or not. And there were, a mining company had put a big investment into her little firm in her mother's garage kind of thing because they could see the opportunities and the savings that they could have. Similarly, if you say drones for fire mapping, they, they don't do it that that well right now, I understand. So the opportunities for people who have an understanding of the forests, an understanding to map with the technology and then the, the programming or whatever else has to go to program these drones. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. The message we're trying to get to, uh, when we're talking to high school students is shift away from I'm going to get a job sweeping up at the mill for $29 an hour and all I have to care about is high school and I don't need to care about the rest because I'm going to have that the mill will always be here and that job will always be here and maybe it will but um, maybe it won't and at least for example what we saw in Houston with the changing in technology people people lost their jobs where the college can help is if people have more education, they're more flexible. They they can they can get into other things. If they if they have don't even have a high school education, and they lose their jobs, it's a tougher scenario. Um, and that's the and it's not. I, I think it's really important to say too, as you say, there's some really positive opportunities coming from it, uh, but. When we look at the data for the Northeast, which is what we did, we see a lot of people without a high school, and this is 2016 data, a lot of people without a high school education. That's different in Chetwin. You have high rates of, of gra uh, graduation, but then I would encourage your children or grandchildren to think, to don't just think, uh, you know, that's it, I'll never go back to school again. It's, it's not to say they have to immediately rush off to NLC or anywhere else, but if they have an attitude of, nope, I can always going to have my $29 an hour job, you're, you're, you're taking a higher risk uh, than, than need be. Um, that's what we're trying to get. Because the people who will, who will program those drones, are not just with a high school education. And in some of these technologies, the sort of backyard mechanic thing isn't going to be good enough. Was anything new or surprising? Or? <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. um, were natural resource based, but none of the ones on the right were natural resource based. They were all about services. That's a that's a good point. Yeah. Information and service. Yeah, that, that's very. And I think as a country, and if you step aside from the northeast, as a country, and as uh, British Columbia, even right now, as we kind of diversify the economy to some degree. I think there's still enormous wealth that comes from the natural resources, oil and gas, for, forestry mining. I'm not 
putting them aside. But I think the development of some of these services, like the the uh, animation cluster and uh, some of the, the film cluster in Vancouver are, are helpful to an economy and that it, it'll buffer it a bit. And we've been saved in certain sense by, by Trump and his immigration policies because you have Microsoft and Amazon and who knows next setting up big offices in Vancouver because of free immigration. They can bring in uh, um, immigrants from other countries easier into Canada and they're, they're building out their they they call them campuses, but building out their their offices. But those people say, well, that's jobs for others. But the thing is, is from those companies, people get training, and then they set up their own companies. If you've ever heard of uh, the pro, I don't know, you may use it in your company, Slack. That company, Slack, is is a Vancouver was a Vancouver based company, bought bought out. So they, people sort of the, the spin offs can also help. And I think there's, uh, as you say, there's enormous opportunities in the natural resource sector to apply not only drones, but other kinds of, of technologies. But for the Northeast to take advantage of it, you need to have as a region educated, and it doesn't have to just be young people, but educated people um, who have that flexibility and who can be trained to, and the college to offer and to think about those things and, and uh, you know, to move to, to for the college to start thinking about, yeah, I mean, where are some of these emerging industries and what could we do to help even prepare? Maybe it's just a part of a course that talks about, you know, you may be working with robots. And, and so it's not like shock, shock when you go into the, to the work for, workforce and, and things are more automated than you expected. Oh, thank you. Out. Yeah, um, I know uh, this week we just hosted uh, Minerals North, the District of Chetwin and the Chetwin Chamber of Commerce, and uh, I managed the trade show portion. And there's a lot going on with drones and the new technology through the through the resource sector, and it was actually oh. it was mind blowing. I oh, okay. The technology that was coming out, it was really really fascinating. I remember hyperventilating over telephone banking. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So <laughs> we can't do it over the phone. <laughs> So everybody has a little red ticket. Oh yeah. You have a door prize donated by uh, Napa Kirarama. Does our keynote want to pull a ticket? Oh yeah, sure. Hopefully it's mine. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, that's only one. There you go. Awesome. And the last number is nine eight one. Yeah. Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, and I'd like to make one other yep. point. If anyone would like to um, talk to us or uh, be interviewed, please uh, give me your card or give Robert your card. And we, we did this in Fort Nelson, and a couple of people were interested, so we followed up by phone if anyone would like to speak further with us. I just had a, another quick comment. You know, um, you brought up a bit Amazon, and uh, I'm a big one in local. I should talk to you 95% if I could. All my income would be spent locally. And I got into this thing, I was looking for a water pump, okay? And just pricing it, and I, well, I'll check on it. I don't know how many people shop at Amazon. But the temptation is really strong for price differential because it is free, you know, free shipping. It's free shipping it's free shipping. And I think one of the interesting trends is going to be how much more people will do that. And then the question is, well, what can, what can actually be done to capture some of that market in the form of depots, and, or, or in the form of actions, not depots, but perhaps finding ways to get into the, uh, the supply of, of products that are not all the, the full range, but certain number of products that are uh, really uh, in demand for, for the world. It might be electric clothing, it might be you know, parts and various Windshield? things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there's just so many things that are really competitive about in Amazon. I think, how do you actually break that? Mm -hmm. And Amazon is uh, just as a, uh, 
point, what Amazon is doing right now in the trucking business in the East Coast, of the, we're doing some work for a transportation group, so that's why we're looking at trucking. But uh, the trucking in the Northeast is what Amazon does, which is tough for businesses, is they're, not, they're losing money on it. So they'll offer a price for, uh, it's, I, I think it's for coordinating the large fleets of trucks that move things, and it's done online. And Amazon is doing it at a significant loss to get the business. So that makes it very tough for other companies to compete if you've got the pockets that Amazon does. Um, because they, they, of course, I mean, they want to get their own fleet of, for trucks, for delivering. You know, they're just, they're Amazon. They're just, they just keep, keep uh, growing. But as I say, it's, it's very tough if someone's selling a product below cost or a service below cost. Very tough to compete. Yeah. I was just going to comment that the college does have a new business management diploma in interactive technologies, and that is in a response to, to this you know, demand for digital skills. And, um, that's available now if anybody wants to take a two-year diploma. <laughs> Working John and Dawson. <laughs>